The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Tony Walton from the Washington State Healthcare Authority. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking time on a Wednesday morning to attend the monthly installment of the Criminal Justice Behavioral Health Interface webinar series. Uh, we're excited to talk about therapeutic or treatment courts today with uh, our presenter from the Center for Court Innovation, Monica Christofferson. Uh, real quick, uh, while we can, let's just go over a couple of specifics about GoToWebinar. Um, I think at this point, everyone is so familiar with these various virtual platforms that this might be redundant, but um, if not, then uh, hopefully it's helpful in one way or the other. And in the meantime, if you have any questions or uh, need any technical assistance, uh, go ahead and utilize the chat function or the questions box on your GoToWebinar screen, which I'll show you where those are momentarily. Uh, first, um, for purpose of questions later on, in the, later on in the presentation, um, if you're participating via phone, uh, just make sure to enter your unique audio pin that you will see when you join the webinar. And that way I can unmute you uh, if you're not actually logged in through your computer. Uh, if you are using your computer audio, there shouldn't be any issues with that. So webinar controls, uh, if you look at the top right of your webinar presentation screen, you'll see various little icons, uh, including an indication of whether or not you are muted. Uh, there's the audio pane, uh, which includes um, the raise and lower hand function. And then also you can expand the questions pane, which will allow you to enter a question or um, a chat pane as well. With the hand raising function, green means go and red means stop. So green means that your hand is currently down and if you press it, you want to talk. And then if, uh, if it indicates a little red arrow pointing down, that means that your hand is up and that's the, uh, the function to lower your hand. So basically, if you see green and click on it, it means you want to raise your hand. If you see red, it means stop raising your hand. Okay, so for those of you who this is your first uh, webinar attendance, we have been providing these webinars since January of 2020. And uh, the overall goal or focus has been to identify and provide information along the stops of the sequential intercept model. Um, the very first presentation was on the sequential intercept model. And uh, that uh, Policy Research Associates was uh, gracious enough to present on back in January. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, specialty courts or therapeutic courts or treatment courts or even problem solving courts, uh, which, as you can see on the slide, is on intercept three. And I already received a question about the PowerPoint. And yes, I will include and attach a PDF version of the PowerPoint and also a whole bunch of other resources and links that we cover. So therapeutic courts, looking at the um, Intercept 3, the first therapeutic court in Washington were established back in 1994 in, in Pierce County and King County. Since then, therapeutic courts have expanded into 29 counties and include adult drug courts, juvenile drug courts, family treatment courts, mental health courts, DUI courts, veterans treatment courts, and a number of various other specialty calendars. We invited the Center for Court Innovation to come talk about the various treatment court models today, including a more recent model called the Opioid Intervention Court. The Center for Court Innovation seeks to help to create a more fair and humane justice system through operating programs, expert assistance, and research. They have a great team that provides training and technical assistance to statewide treatment court systems, and they, hate, and they assist state-level drug court coordinators and other officials to enhance the operation of already existing drug courts in their state. Uh, the Center for Court Innovation has 
allowed and provided Monica Christofferson today um, to provide an overview of these various models. In her role at the Center for Core Innovation, she provides expert assistance to states around the country on implementation and enhancement of treatment goals. So Monica, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, thank you for having me. I'm gonna go ahead and make you the presenter so that you can uh, share any PowerPoint slides or resources that you have. And then I'll Great, be thanks. kind of fielding any information in the meantime, but uh, let's see here. Hold on one second. And the presenter, there we go. Okay, hit show my screen. And I believe what you should be seeing is my PowerPoint, am I right? Yep, yeah, coming through great, thank you. Okay, great, thank you so much for the introduction, Tony. Um, I really appreciate it, I appreciate you guys having me. I also appreciate you guys being up early. I am currently in the Midwest, um, and so it is 11.30 a.m. my time, which is not as uh, bad as your morning. Um, okay, so we're gonna do a pretty quick overview. I wanna leave time for questions for you guys. So I'm gonna go through um, some of the main court models um, that you see in, just like Tony said, treatment court programs, they're called treatment courts, problem solving courts, specialty courts, it really depends on the jurisdiction. Okay, so we're gonna start with adult drug treatment courts because that is, um, that is the really the basis, it's the oldest type and it's the basis for the rest of the court programs that we're gonna talk about basically. So adult drug treatment courts are specialized courts that are focusing on cases involving offenders with substance use disorders. That is, that's the basic idea. Um, these started, you know, more than 30 years ago. I believe Miami-Dade was probably the first official adult drug treatment court. Um, they started to see uh, offenders or people coming in and engaging with the justice system who were recycling through the court and we were committing crimes that were in support of their substance use disorder. And so it was obvious that the traditional case processing that we were using um, of you know getting charged and going to jail and then amping up your jail time with every charge that you got until you were in jail you know, for quite a long time was not working. Um, so under this model, it is trying to refocus on the root cause of that engagement in the justice system and address that instead of criminalizing substance use disorder. So, you know, your adult drug treatment court is going to provide judicially supervised treatment and other supportive services. There is a multidisciplinary team approach. So you have, and I'm gonna go over the team a little bit uh, more in depth so that you can see what I'm talking about, but you're gonna have a treatment provider, a case manager, peer recovery support, probation, attorneys, and judges, all at the same table dealing with the case. And then the, the goal is to combine treatment and accountability to break the cycle of crime and incarceration. Um, there's been a lot of research done on adult drug treatment courts. Um, they are evidence-based and we're gonna go over the national best practice standards in a little bit too. Um, and you have seen their most studies, not all studies, but most studies show that they do reduce the incidence of recidivism. So adult drug treatment courts are based on 10 key components that have been around for almost as long as drug treatment courts have. Um, so these are the, the basic tenants that you wanna see in a program that calls itself an adult drug treatment court. And so you're gonna to need to see the integration of alcohol and other drug treatment services with uh, justice system case processing. Um, and so while you're looking at this, you want to compare it to the traditional idea of case processing. Um, and so when you look at your, your intercept model, what you would be seeing at arraignment um, and moving through the traditional criminal justice system, this, as you see, even just in that model, is a diversion into a specialty court. And there are numerous ways that you can do that diversion. Um, I'll talk a little bit about referrals so that you guys have an idea of how cases get into these drug treatment courts. Um, but while you're looking at these components, compare them to what you think of traditional case processing. 
The second one, which is a stark contrast to what we know about our criminal justice system, is that this is a non-adversarial approach. Um, and in saying that, we are clear that you are still promoting public safety, which is the goal of the prosecutor's office, and protects, protecting the participants' due process rights, which is the goal of the public defender or the defense counsel on the team. Um, but you are taking away the idea of who is winning this case or, um, yeah, who is who is winning this case in, in whatever that means to each side. And you are looking instead on a non-adversarial approach that is trying to say, the goal of this is to treat the root cause, like I said, of engagement in the criminal justice system. And that is in the best interest of public safety and in the best interest of the client for the defense attorney. The next one is early identification and prompt placement. This is really directly related to your guys' com longer conversation about the sequ sequential intercept model. Um, and it's also one of the hardest things for treatment court programs to accomplish is early identification and prompt placement. Um, the, the goal for different court models is different. When we get to opioid intervention courts, we're going to talk about, you know, what what early identification means compared to traditional treatment court programs if it is pre-plea or or post-plea but really you want to be identifying people at arraignment or prior to arraignment so the first time that they're touching the courtroom or the criminal justice system um, you are moving them into a position that they can have access to treatment as soon as possible and that's the ultimate goal of the treatment court programs is, is to move them quickly into a position where they can access their case managers their treatment programs um, and make peer recovery supports etc Access to a continuum of alcohol, alcohol, drug, and other treatment and rehabilitation services. Um, frequent alcohol and drug testing. This is kind of a main tenant of the adult drug treatment court. I think some people would argue it is emphasized more than the other components for better or for worse, um, but it is something that is part of the compliance monitoring in almost all drug treatment court, in all drug treatment courts is gonna be um, constant alcohol and drug monitoring testing. Um, they say frequent, it should also say um, random, frequent and random alcohol and drug testing. Okay, so the rest of the components, you're looking at a coordinated strategy that governs responses to a participant's compliance. This is where you're going to get into incentives, um, therapeutic adjustments, and sanctions. Um, there has definitely been a long a, a movement from strictly sanctions to this idea of incentives and therapeutic adjustments um, being really beneficial for participants to be um, shown the positive work that they have done. And when you are getting a positive drug test um, or drugs have been indicated um, or reported by the participant or by their case manager, then looking first at therapeutic adjustment and then working your way up to sanctions if necessary, but really saving sanctions for things like lying to the court, tampering with a drug test, um, you know, re-arrest or re-offense or things like that. Um, and, and to note that I will just plug that for sanctions, jail is used as a sanction in, in most adult drug treatment courts, um, but the research has shown that jail should be used incredibly sparingly and if possible, not at all. Um, the next one is ongoing judicial interaction with each participant. This is a huge diversion from your traditional case processing where you might see a judge once, maybe twice, and it might not be the same judge. Um, and so ongoing judicial interaction is looking at the fact that the judge plays a really um, influential role on the entire criminal justice system um, and on each case and on each defendant or participant. And so when you are going through a drug treatment court to have judicial interaction that is with a judge who has maybe been trained in, who should have been trained in substance use disorder, possibly motivational interviewing, things along that line where they can have a positive and effective um, interactions with the participant to encourage their continued compliance, to congratulate them on doing well, and to pass down sanctions to say, I understand maybe you know, where you've been and how hard you've worked in this program and here's the sanction and here's I want, how I want you to do better. 
Um, so the judicial interactions and, and how a judge speaks to a participant and how they interact with a participant is actually hugely in a, influential in the outcomes for most treatment courts. Um, okay, so monitoring and evaluation, obviously you need to be measuring the achievement of the program um, goals and effectiveness, you really need to be focusing on whether or not what you're doing is reaching um, the goals that you have stated and making sure that your outcomes are actually more beneficial for the participants going through your program. Um, continuing interdisciplinary education, obviously you should be trained in a whole host of things to be um, working within a specialized court and that is going to change maybe based on each different kind of court, but at a baseline for all of these treatment courts, you're going to want substance use um, treatment and understanding substance use disorders, understanding um, mental health diagnoses and mental illness, um, and I would say probably things such as CBT and motivational interviewing, having a, a at least cursory understanding of um, what that is and what it means. And then criminal thinking and risk re need responsivity, I would add in there as well. Um, and then the last one is just forging partnerships among drug courts, public agencies, community-based organizations, et cetera. So drug courts at their baseline, like I said, are evidence-based and a lot of that research comes from NADCP, the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. They have best practice standards that have been around for, I think, maybe one or two decades, but they have just revamped them. In 2019, they came out with um, just an updated version of their standards that, you know, have, helps with remedying some language and ensuring that they were still um, on par with where the national best practice standards should be. So a couple things to note here, for your purposes of thinking about a, a treatment core and what it can do for people and how people can engage with it when they are being walked through this or engaging in this sequential intercept model is one is target population. Drug courts have been researched pretty extensively and what it shows is that your target population should be high risk high need and we certainly don't have time to get into risk need responsivity i imagine um, plenty of people on this webinar right now are, are well versed in that or have heard of that um, but what it is the very very dumbed down version is that those who are the highest risk had the highest need are the ones who this intensive intervention serves best. And so when you have somebody who is low risk and low need and maybe has their first offense or, you know, it's, you know, they have a, a caught a possession case or something like that, to put them into a drug court program that is going to require drug testing once, twice, three times a week, interaction with a judge once a week, you know, uh, meeting with your case manager once or twice a week, what you're doing is you're overdosing for that person, and you may even be overdosing for treatment, and taking them away of what could be otherwise pro-social activities for them. So drug courts can be harmful if you are not looking at who your target population is, screening for the appropriate target population, and then referring that appropriate target population into the treatment court program. Um, this gets a little, messy when you talk about what prosecutors usually are willing to accept, prosecutors and judges are willing to accept as far as cases. Um, not everybody is on board with accepting felony cases, um, cases with violence, cases with uh, guns, um, even cases where uh, there is the indication that they may be selling drugs. So you can't always catch some of your felony cases that would really easily fit into the high risk high need. Um, but it's still important to remember that when you're dealing with these cases, that is what you're looking at is high risk, high need. And then the rest of these, if you are if you are interested in kind of diving a little deeper into what the best practices are for a, a drug treatment court, and you really want to see what that would look like, these are easily accessible. And um, I think Tony is going to have have links. I have you know the names of these at the end of the presentation, and so you can see what these are. Um, and then just a note about the multidisciplinary team, because it is so much different than what you are looking at in, like I said, traditional case processing. Your 
the bones of your multidisciplinary team for a treatment court, and we'll talk about the differences of what these are in the different models, but the bones of it is going to be a judge, community supervision, so probation usually, law enforcement officer, um, defense counsel representative, and there's some constitutional law implications there that we can talk about if you're interested, um, treatment representative, prosecutor, and a program coordinator. And so what you are doing is taking, an evaluator is there, evaluator is an important part of the component, but it's not necessarily a, a team member. So what you're doing is you're taking all of these people who traditionally would just be touching, you know, a, a participant's engagement in the system at totally different times, ancillary times, sometimes parallel times, but never communicating with one another, except for maybe absent, you know, probation reporting to the judge for non-compliance. But they aren't, they aren't communicating about the participant in um, a coordinated way. And that is what a drug treatment court uh, tries to achieve, is that you're gonna have all of these people, one, trained in, substance use disorder, trained in criminal thinking, trained in, you know, risk need responsivity, trained in these reasons that people may be engaged in the criminal justice system. And then you have a system set up where you have pre-court staff meetings where you all get together um, to talk through what's going on, what information you have, and has there been a positive or a negative test, did they attend their group meeting, etc. And you start to work together to say, you know, okay, treatment is telling us that this is what should happen for this participant. And then the judge is making that decision with the buy-in from the prosecutor and defense counsel. And so you have a coordinated response to either bad, good, or indifferent behavior. Um, this obviously in law involves a lot of sharing information. You know, when you're getting into the nuts and bolts of your treatment court, you're going to start to talk about HIPAA and 42 CFR Part 2 and how you share information and confidentiality. Um, but that's a little too, probably too much for this. Um, and then communication and decision making. A note here is that under these treatment court programs, the judge is still ultimately making the decision and that is for a number of reasons a lot of them constitutional but the judge is still the ultimate decision maker here what you want is a team that has an understanding of each person's responsibilities to the participant to the court and to the public but is willing and able to share that information with each other so that the judge can make the most informed decision that um, is possible um, I think we'll probably just save questions to end. And but if you do have any, I think you can just write them in the chat box and we'll get to them after. Okay. So moving on from adult drug treatment courts, that's kind of the baseline. Where where most programs started from was that model that we just went over. Veterans treatment courts are incredibly similar, are incredibly similar to adult drug treatment courts. But what you're looking at with veterans treatment courts is that these are specialized courts focusing on cases involving offenders or participants with substance use disorders who have served in the US military. A caveat here is that I put in the US military, I've done a, a lot of work in a really big project on veterans treatment courts and I have gotten some people who say that they accept military service members who have served in uh, militaries in other countries, but that's that's really rather near mm -hmm. here nor there, but it is built around kind of the culture of the US military. Um, and this is the same as adult drug treatment courts. They provide judicially supervised treatment and other supportive services. What you're gonna see here with the use of a multidisciplinary approach, it is the same that you have this team of people who are coming in to share information and to walk somebody through the, the program. But some of your players are different here. Do you have treatment providers, BJOs, which are veteran judges, Veterans Justice Outreach Specialists, it's a mouthful. The VA, which are two added, um, probation, attorneys, judges, and more. Um, so with, with the Veterans Treatment Courts, the biggest difference is that what you are doing is structuring your program around the knowledge that this person has been a part of the military and then you're responding so it's really a responsivity type model you are responding to a model that works best for the experience that they've had um, and so you're going to 
Okay, we'll go over those. So you're you're going to see that a veterans treatment court would take otherwise eligible adult drug treatment court participants. The difference is going to be that they have served in the military, and it it came around because it came out of Buffalo, um, New York, which is just a you know a hub of innovative treatment court programs. It's where opioid intervention courts started, also. So it came out of Buffalo. They started, the judge there who ran their treatment court started seeing a lot of participants who were not faring very well in the traditional adult drug treatment court. And he was talking to them in you know, his, his judicial interactions and finding out that he was seeing a lot of veterans and more than you know, would be indicated by the population that is present in Buffalo, New York. And so what we know is that veterans do have a high incidence, proportionally high incidence of being involved in the criminal justice system. Um, and the VA has done some work to address that. And one of those things is veterans justice outreach, VJOs specialists, um, whose main focus is to do outreach into um, jails, courtrooms, um, probation, parole, to try to reach people who are veterans and who are engaged in the criminal justice system and provide them with services. So the Buffalo model recognized that this was a problem, started working with the VA and the BJOs to say, we can do something better, we can do something better. And so here are some of the main differences between VTCs and um, adult drug treatment courts is the key components are almost all identical and here are the ones that are a little bit different is that you're gonna see that when they are providing access to a continuum of um, alcohol, drug, mental health, other related treatment services, part of that continuum should be veteran peer mentors. Veteran peer mentors haven't been comprehensively studied, neither have veteran treatment courts, um, but what we have heard anecdotally throughout the uh, hundreds of courts throughout the country is that veteran peer mentors usually make the difference between, you know, make a huge difference in the success of a participant. Um, and so it's somebody who has served in the US military in, in some of the best programs, the ones that I would hold as, you know, the gold standard, they're able to, you know, connect somebody who has the same branch of military service, maybe the same gender, and maybe some of the same diagnoses um, or, or combat experience, so that they have somebody who they can really relate to, to say that I have dealt with dealt with this, I understand what you're going through, I, I understand how transition to civilian services or civilian life is difficult. And then in your interdisciplinary training, the biggest component that you're going to make sure that you need that's not in adult drug treatment courts is military culture training. Um, a lot of these programs, they you know, stand at attention, they play the national anthem, they raise the flag, they have the flags of each military branch, they give out military points or medals um, for participants who are doing well. They really are understanding of the fact that they want to honor the service, they want to honor the fact that you are a veteran, and in doing that, they help with the esteem that goes into you um, participating well in the program. And then the last one is, you know, forging the partnerships. Obviously, the VA is a huge component of this. Um, most veterans are able to get services, free services at the VA. I shouldn't say most, but a lot of veterans are able to get free services at the VA. Um, and those who aren't, the VJOs are also really good at helping with, you know, upping your discharge status or working through some of the bureaucracy of the VA to find out how you can get services. And so, um, that is the basics of veterans treatment courts. A lot of places, if they don't have enough veterans, they run it as a track um, within their adult drug treatment court. And so they meet on a separate day, but it's it's the same judge, it's a lot of the same players, so they don't have to form a whole new team. It's just that they're you know inviting the VA and VJOs to come in um, on that docket. So we've seen that a lot. Um, okay, mental health court, who am I doing on time? Okay, mental health court. Um, this is, it differs more significantly than veterans treatment court because you are not doing drug testing is really one of the biggest differences that you're going to see and so your compliance and your incentives and therapeutic adjustments and sanctions are going to look different but it is the same basic idea is that you are trying to look at the root cause of engagement in the criminal justice system and the same pattern was happening that was happening with 
um, people with substance use disorders is that you're seeing people who suffer from mental health, who are coming into the criminal justice system and are just repeating. And usually for offenses that, um, you know, not always for low level, but a lot of times for low level offenses like, you know, pandering, like um, loitering, like solicitation, um, all of those things that really we would qualify as crimes of poverty. Um, and so mental health courts are new, much newer than drug treatment courts, and they are specialized courts focusing on cases involving offenders with serious and persistent mental health disorders. And what you're looking at here is the prime focus is the linkage of participants to long-term treatment as an alternative to incarceration. So this creates a link between the justice system and mental health systems that also prior in, in any other traditional case processing, you are not going to get information from a mental health system. You're also not going to be a conduit or a liaison between um, the justice system and the mental health system. They operate fully separate and oftentimes because you are engaged in the justice system, you are not able to access mental health services due to incarceration or um, other factors. And so the goal is to improve public safety by ensuring that participants receive high quality community based services. Um, and this is going to have the same idea, the same basic team members, you know, judges, your mental health treatment, um, probation, law enforcement, um, your court coordinator, etc. Uh, the Center for Court Innovation runs a few mental health courts as part of um, our on-site programming. And so the Brooklyn Mental Health Court has been in existence um, for quite a while. And some of the statistics that they've been able to see are that they have a 46% reduction in the likelihood of re-arrest for participants versus a comparison group. A 29% reduction in the likelihood of a reconviction for a participant in the comparison group. And I think the one that is really impactful is an 84% of active participants in compliance with court mandates. And here I would just point out that court mandates is, is going to treatment, is keeping your appointments, is going to your programming. Um, and so having 84% of participants who are engaging in you know, services, I think that really um, speaks volumes for the ways that this type of court program can help. Okay, family treatment court. The family treatment court differs the most significantly. I think family treatment court and maybe opioid intervention differ the most significantly from the rest of the models that we have talked about. Family treatment court is a juvenile or family court docket for cases of child abuse or neglect in which a parental, um, in which parental substance use is a contributing factor. So this is is looking at family tre treatment court is. Um, I think the most complex out of all of them because you have so many different players who are involved. This is not the state who is looking to prosecute an individual. This is when you have, you're going to have mom, dad, potentially both parents, mom, mom, dad, dad, potentially two parents who are involved in an abuse or neglect, and then also the child. And so there's the potential that you have an attorney for each parent, you have an attorney for the child, and then you have the attorney who's bringing the case of abuse or neglect. And so there is, and then you have a children's services worker, um, and then you may have a criminal case that's also coming from, you know, the, the filing of abuse or neglect. So there are so many players that are involved and it's such a complex system that family treatment court is really trying to get again at the full the goal is to serve families with these complex needs that require intensive treatment accountability monitoring services and supports for a successful reunification um, and that is the ultimate goal is to safely reunify children with their parents while giving parents the resources and the treatment that they need to be safe and effective parents. And so um, I sat through a presentation that was talking about the NADCP just came out with national best practice standards for family treatment courts as well, which is fantastic um, and is really, I think, going to help programs across the country help hold themselves to the standard that is the most beneficial for their clients and participants. Um, but I was in a presentation with them and they have some statistics that I can't set off the top of my head, but I know are there. Um, just talking about 
how engagement in a family treatment court has reduced the amount of time pretty significantly for children being out of the care of their parents. And there's all sorts of indicators of why that is a good thing. Um, but it is it's mostly beneficial for the, the children and their development and their stability um, to be in a safe and stable home with their parents who they know as their parents. And so that is the goal of the family treatment court. Um, this kind of just highlights what I was saying that under the more traditional family court system, there is a disconnect between family court, child protective services, and substance use disorder treatment. And they do not talk to each other. Just like in all these other court systems, you are not having um, all of these really important players talk to each other until you bring them to the table. And so it leads to uncoordinated and limited services. Um, and it also leads to, I've seen this a lot, my prior life was in um, family court working with intimate partner violence, but what it often leads to is conflicting court orders and conflicting direction on how you can best work your case to reunify with your children. Um, and so the NDCI, the National Drug Institute, and the Center for Children and Family Futures have a planning guide for family treatment courts. That's also something, you know, they have the best practice standards, but if you're looking at kind of really diving into the, the bones of what a family treatment court would look like or needs to look like, or you have you want more information about that, this planning guide is very comprehensive. Um, and Children Center for Children and Family Futures is the TA provider for, um, um, for family treatment court, courts when you get a grant under BJA, so. Um, I'm not gonna go through each one of these, I don't think, but, um, this is just to showcase that they also have core common characteristics, kind of like the, the 10 essential elements of the other courts that we have looked at. The focus being on permanency, safety, and welfare um, of abused and neglected children, as well as the needs of the parents. And so, like I said, in the current system we have, each one of those needs is addressed kind of individually. So if a parent wants treatment, they go to treatment, but it's not always, um, it is not always reported back to the CPS worker. And then the CPS worker is, is specifically dealing with the child. So there's all sorts of um, coordinated responses that need to happen. And that helps when you are focusing on the family as a whole and when your goal is safe reunification. Um, early intervention, assessment, facilitated access to services for parents and children. Um, and just a note for family treatment courts is that there are different models with the judges that are dealing with them. Like I said, there, there could be a number of different cases involved. Some places have a one family, one judge um, court model where the judge who handles the family is going to hear every case about it. Criminal, family, abuse and neglect. Um, and then other models have parallel judges where the judges are in communication with each other, but um, there's somebody different handling the family court and maybe then the abuse and neglect. And so it just depends on your jurisdiction. Each one can have its pros and cons, ex parte communication, um, you know, if you feel like you have a biased judge or et cetera, and they're dealing with every case involving your family, um, or hearing information from a criminal case that wouldn't necessarily come in in a family case, or vice versa. So, and then there's also, court models that are pre-file and post-file, just like there are, are drug court models that are pre-plea and post-plea. I can answer questions about those differences if you want me to. Um, but that's just to say that some models engage uh, parents who have, have been assessed for substance use disorder before they file abuse and neglect claims, and most models engage them after a filing has been made already. Um, so I'll let you read through these. They are not so much different than, than really what we have been talking about, you know, service plans, case management, regular staffing meetings, um, judicial supervision, increased judicial supervision of the children and the families. So you're having more communication. Um, yeah, so. Okay, opioid intervention court. I think after this, I'm gonna end like right on time for 15 minutes of questions. So opioid intervention courts are the newest court model. Um, and they are in their relative infancy. Again, Buffalo was the innovator here. And 
wanted to address, you know, our, our national opioid crisis and wanted to address the overdose crisis that they were seeing within um, their own participants. So what they started to see was that somebody was arrested and had come in for arraignment. And even if they were being assessed at that time for participation in drug court, it took too long for them to get into drug court, to get into treatment or to get um, a, an answer on drug court. And they were seeing overdoses between arraignment and even the next court hearing um, or even arrest and arraignment at times. And so they wanted to come up with a way that they could operate as a, a more immediate rapid response program that uses an immediate screening and treatment engagement, intensive judicial monitoring and recovery support services to prevent opioid overdose and save lives. Uh, one small caveat here is that um, Tony Knight talks about this briefly before this started. Um, this is a new model and so it's called opioid intervention court. There has been murmurs um, just around from experts to try to look at it maybe as overdose intervention court. Um, if you, just based on the drugs that you're seeing, the, the presence of maybe fentanyl and drugs that wouldn't regularly be indicated for opioid um, overdose, et cetera, you might want to, just as you conceptualize what this program could look like in your jurisdiction, um, you know, try to be as broad as possible when you're looking at who this screening would um, be catching but it uses the same multidisciplinary approach, you know, treatment providers, case managers, probation, attorneys, judges, you need all the same people at the table to agree to this. One of the biggest differences between this model and most other drug court models is that prosecutors agree to suspend prosecution. And so you need to have a, a good understanding with your prosecutor's office and a good understanding with your judge but the goal is that you are telling somebody, we are putting on pause your entire engagement with the judicial system, because what we want to address first is your risk of overdose. And so the first thing we are concerned about is your life. And the second thing we are concerned about, I mean, third, fourth, whatever. But later down the line, we will handle this engagement in the criminal justice system. But the first thing that we wanna do is ensure that you are set up with the treatment that you need to, um, to prevent overdose. So the 10 essential elements, I am gonna go through each one of these because they are um, considerably different. So broad legal eligibility criteria. When we're talking about adult drug treatment courts, uh, veterans treatment courts, mental health, you want high risk, high need. Um, and also you are usually really, really restricted by who the prosecutor is able, who you are able to take in based on um, usually your prosecutor's office and who they've been willing to say can have, you know, a deferred sentence or a reduced sentence or, you know, even diversion, et cetera. Here, what you want is the broadest legal eligibility because the goal is not at the end of the day, the goal is usually not a, is not you know, a dismissal of the case. Sometimes that happens um, if it's low level, especially. But the goal is not always a dismissal of the case. The goal is that you are addressing somebody at risk of overdose. And so the broadest legal eligibility criteria that you can possibly negotiate is the best because you want to catch everybody who is at risk. And then immediate screening for risk of overdose. This is where if you start looking at your sequential intercept model again, arraignment is too late. So arraignment is not, this is not set up to be something where at arraignment you say, okay, we might send you for an assessment. We think you might be eligible for a drug court. We think that would be best. You've been in here twice for you know, possession. We think it, it's possible that this could benefit you. This is where you, know, you want from a lot of court programs in New York pre-bail reform, the way that they did this is that immediately after arrest, they wanted within, within 12 to 24 hours of arrest, somebody had been to that person to assess them for, um, for risk of overdose. And um, it, looks, it looks more complicated now in New York because we do have bail reform, which um, 
is great in so many ways, but it just complicates the way that people can um, find, you know, those who have been given instead of arrested and held until arraignment have been given des a desk appearance ticket. But the goal is pre, you know, intercept two. You really want intercept zero and one to be where you are catching people to say, if you have an interaction with law enforcement or if you have engaged in the the first touch of you engaging in the criminal justice system you want a screening as soon as possible because that is the whole point of the model um informed consent after consultation with defense counsel it is hard it's hard to move anything quickly through the justice system but the goal here is that somebody has the ability to talk to defense counsel before um, they consent to an opioid intervention court. And then here, suspension of prosecution or expedited plea. Suspension of prosecution is what I would emphasize here is that you are saying we, we are not going to prosecute this case until you are done with you know, the, the 90 days of um, stabilization. And then once that happens, different programs operate differently. Some of them say, this has no bearing on your case whatsoever. So if, if you do well in this program, then you end and that's it. And then we just process the case as we normally would. Some take it into consideration. What is emphasized the most, the most, is that failure to complete an opioid intervention program, if you stop showing up, if you don't go to court, if you don't check in with a judge, should not be held against you when your case is ultimately processed. And that's where you gotta get your, and that's the only way you're gonna get defense counsel on board, but that's where you really gotta get your prosecutors on board as well and your judges on board. So they're not looking at this person and saying, well, you failed this program. And so I would have dismissed this case, but now I'm not going to. And so that needs to be ingrained in the culture of your opioid intervention court to be sure that you really, um, you really, when when you are telling somebody that this is the first thing we're concerned about is your life and your risk of overdose, that it isn't used against them later. Rapid clinical assessment and treatment engagement. Um, there are courts that have mobile MAT. Um, mobile MAT treatment providers who, when somebody is assessed at court, they can walk out of court and walk into, you know, a, an MAT mobile van. I don't think it's a van, but like mobile clinic, mobile clinic is what I'm looking for. And right then and there be, be assessed and get access to MAT within 24 hours. And that's incredibly, um, that's incredibly helpful because you are telling somebody that we are able to work with you before you possibly have to go into detox. So recovery support services, same peer recovery support, frequent judicial supervision and compliance monitoring. The Buffalo Court model does everyday check-ins. Um, and so for the 90 days that you are engaged in their opioid court, you are checking in every day with the judge. Other places have modified that just based on, you know, their capacity um, and their participants capacity, honestly. So there are a lot of ways that you can creatively do this, especially with how much technology that we are forced to use right now. But, you know, FaceTime, um, Zoom check-ins, call into your case manager every day, but you should be um, seeing and having the judge lay eyes on you probably a couple times a week. Intensive case management, of course, program com completion and continuum of care. Um, program completion is really what we're looking for here. Drug court has all sorts of things that they want before programs are completed. You know, um, you're, you're really, you're phasing up five phases in most programs. Here, what we want is clinical stabilization. And so what we're looking for is that you are stable. And that might mean that afterwards, you go to court and your case is dismissed, or afterwards, if you're facing a more serious charge, you might even benefit from then being referred into a traditional adult drug treatment court. Um, and then of course, performance evaluation program improvement. With every single one of these, you should be constantly doing monitor and evaluating of your outcome measures to make sure, again, that you are producing the, the results you say you are, producing the results that you tell your participants you wanna produce. Um, and also not doing unintentional harm. Okay, here are just some resources. This is where you're gonna see, you know, the big four. So um, Center for Court Innovation, we have 
um, a website called treatmentcourts.org and it has online lessons that go through a whole host, I mean, treatment, um, risk need responsivity, a lot of the things that I've talked about today, you can go to that website and it's free. You have to like log in, but it's free and you can access a whole host of um, online webinars from experts around the country. And then NADCP is also a huge hub of information. They, under them is Justice for Vets and NDCI, which has a ton of information. If you are looking for best practice standards, um, any information about veterans treatment courts, um, a lot of research at NDCI. And then Children and Family Futures, if you want information on family treatment courts and um, SAMHSA for mental health courts. Okay, questions. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you so much. You covered so much information in such a short amount of time. And we didn't even get to some of the other court models like tribal healing to wellness courts, juvenile treatment courts. Um, there just really are just so many various ways to kind of uh, address the behavioral health needs of individuals at that particular uh, intercept. Um, you know, one thing I was thinking of is how much uh, overlap there are between the various programs, like pretty much every adult drug court is also a family recovery court, you know, because family is involved at some point. And mental health court, we all know that co-occurring disorders are very prevalent with the population. So uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Me, um, I'm going to start with the questions that were posed through the question pane, and then I'll go to individuals with their hand raised. So uh, one was less of a, a question and more of a comment, but basically uh, Lane Pavey indicated, can we try to stop using stigmatizing language uh, by calling individuals offenders? Um, and uh, I think the, the, the focus here is that, you know, it's individuals with uh, a criminal history or um, using the term participant. Um, and, you know, Lane, I, I completely agree that, uh, you know, we, we do need to use uh, person first language and identify the individual themselves, not um, calling them offenders and whatnot. I reference just the fact that most of the research and the best practices refer to offenders. But thank you for that comment, Lane. Yeah, absolutely. And Tony, can you just add in? Um, I, I absolutely hear that critique, and I'm going to make sure to change that language in this presentation. Um, as with most presentations, you pull from prior ones, and this probably had a different audience, but you're absolutely right that no matter the audience, that, um, that, is, that is a critique that I absolutely will take and be sure that it is reflected um, in the language in the presentation and the language I use. So I apologize for that. I hope that... Um, no, thank yeah, you. Yeah, change. Oh, yeah, thank for sure. Um, and then uh, Larry Jefferson had several comments. One was regarding um, prosecutors' control about who can enter a specialty court. Um, if the prosecutor disagrees, there is no format for the defense attorney or other members to have a hearing to make a group decision. Um, and the question is, do you see this problem anywhere? And if so, is there any movement to change a movement to change for this obstacle? in terms of having uh, the prosecutor being kind of like the gatekeeper, having one person be the gatekeeper for a specialty court admission? Yes. Um, it, is, it is a big problem. It's a big problem. We see it all over the place. Um, every jurisdiction is different. Every state is different on how they run things. But what I will say is that it's an issue that comes up in almost every in almost every program that we talk to. So one thing that I would say is that the movement the movement is there to understand that a singular gatekeeper is going to produce bias, is going to produce um, unfair results and is really it, it really is going to not give you access to the full um, list of eligible participants who could be in your program. And so the singular gatekeeper of a prosecutor is a big problem. One way that you can help to combat that is one, having pre-staff, not making them the initial screening entity, 
And so seeing if you can have a pre-staff meeting about somebody who's potential with the prosecutors in the room um, and talk through why each person thinks that that, um, that participant would benefit from the treatment court to see if you can make some movement. But, and if they are high risk, if they are otherwise eligible, if they have a substance use disorder, if they, if, if it is indicated that they could benefit from this, then sometimes a pre-staff meeting that talks about that and puts it out in the open, puts it back on the prosecutor's office to explain to you guys and really the judge why you're denying this person um, entry or saying no. The other big problem that you're going to see is that sometimes people are going to be um, denied entry based on prior criminal history or based on the charges that they're facing at that moment. And that also is something that really um, comes up with the prosecutor's office. They're the ones who are going to choose what, what they charge them with. Um, and so that's another problem, but that sometimes it's helpful if you have really comprehensive training for every prosecutor, including the head prosecutor on um, the benefits of high risk high need and um, how it can it can help benefit public safety. But it is an issue that we see all the time. Um, the the best way to handle it really, I think, to, even no matter how your court team is set up, no matter how your program is set up, because some, you know, it's it's the judge's decision, some it's it, it's completely objective. If they meet the criteria one, two, three, four, then they're in. But regardless, having um, a team dynamic that is really non-adversarial, that is really um, focused on the goals of the program is to, um, is to serve these participants in a way that is more beneficial than the traditional case processing. Usually you can combat a lot of that, even if they are the gatekeeper, if you guys have good communication, good training, um, ongoing communication, pre-staffing meetings that talk about each new potential, um, you can sometimes combat some of the issues that come up with a gatekeeper. Thank you so much, Monica. And um, I, what I'll do is there's several other questions in the question pane that we're not going to be able to get to, but I will uh, record those and um, forward them to you. And if you don't mind following up with those individuals, or I can just provide the resources and answers in uh, the meeting recording and the uh, presentation slides I send out after. Um, I did see, I think we have time for just one more, at least question from Sharon McKellery. You have your hand raised. I just want to make sure that uh, I identified you and provided you the opportunity to ask your question. So you've been unmuted, Sharon. So you'll have to uh, unmute yourself on your end as well. Thank you so much. First, I want to tell you guys, oh my goodness, you guys really, really need to be in charge uh, of the adult, uh, correction, adult drug treatment for uh, I myself, uh, 10 years ago, was in the adult drug, drug treatment for and I do have been a 100% change. Um, I like the fact that you're meeting people where they are. I was wondering, uh, are you familiar with peers? Because now I'm a peer. Um, I feel this would be a great addition in helping guide uh, participants through this process because a lot of times you're still not understanding the process and it makes you very frustrated. Mm -hmm. um, I like the fact uh, that you guys are now looking at each case uh, being different because when I was going through the drug court, I was put in life with everybody else. And my needs and my uh, treatment uh, was a little bit different than what I was being deemed, you know, like the other participant. And so um, I would appreciate if that could be looked at as well. But I just, I think it's so important because you can see the depth Sharon, thank you so much for your comments and thank you so much for 
uh, sharing your story with us and congratulations on all that you've been through and becoming a peer. And I know that uh, peers are a big piece of recent uh, problem solving court or treatment court movements. And I'll send out some information regarding that uh, with the notes um, along with the presentation recording. And with that, it is 930. So unfortunately, we have ran out of time for any additional questions. Um, but Monica, thank you again so much for making time today and for presenting all the way from the uh, East Coast. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, you and yours and everyone out there are staying safe and well during the COVID times, but thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Okay, take care, everyone. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and close out the webinar. Um, take care and talk to you soon. And oh, one last reminder plug. Uh, last Wednesday of every month from 8.30 to 9.30 is this webinar series. So keep an eye out for the next topic, which will be the Offender Reentry Community Safety Program uh, that Alex Stoker will be presenting on. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Take care.